Zoom recording. And just as a general reminder for everyone, like the talk is 20 minutes, I'll give you a five minute warning with a bell sound. And then we have a time for 10 minutes of questions. So please don't be shy, uh, put all of your questions in either um, the, on Slack or here on the Zoom chat. And uh, Morgan will be handling the Q&A. So Leonardo, take it away. Thank you. Let me start sharing my screen. Okay. Uh, all right. Are you are you seeing like a little like Zoom thing here? Because it, it is on my screen, but um, oh, no. No. All right. It's fine then. We see your cursor though. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, the cursor is fine. All right. Cool. Uh, thank you all for for coming to to the seminar. I, I really appreciate it. And um, so in my research, I considered that planets, uh, they are in many ways very similar to stars, even the small planets. And I think, I think part of that is because of my sort of my scientific up, upbringing in, in astronomy. I started doing research with stars and then I transitioned to exoplanets. So I, when I studied them, I like to see them all together as a system. And um, planets, they also evolve and they change in the same time scales as their host stars, particularly when it comes to their atmospheres. And one of my favorite examples is actually in the solar system. And uh, if I can pass this line, there you go. It's in Mars, we think that its atmosphere and surface changed a lot through time. And uh, in my research, I studied the upper parts of the atmosphere and, and the exospheres of exoplanets. And these parts are very exposed to, high, to the high energy environment provided by the host star. And we know that it evolved significantly, particularly in the early ages of the, of the, stellar, of the planetary system. Now the atmospheric structure that I refer to is something like this. So you have your planet in red, and in orange and yellow, you have the lower and upper atmosphere, which are which contain gas in a collisional regime. And when you go to the what we call the exosphere, that's by definition uh, the collision collisionless regime for uh, for its gas. Every planet has an exosphere, even the Earth. Uh, this is how the Earth's exosphere looks like. This is one of my favorite observations ever because uh, it was a small satellite launched by a team in Japan. And I think this observation was taken, I think uh, 1.5 AU distant from the earth. And the earth is this, this, the central pixel right here. It's this tiny little thing. And this giant blob that you see is our own exosphere made of mostly hydrogen. Uh, and as I said, the, these layers, they are very exposed to the high energy environment around the planet and they react to it. And one of their main reactions is uh, what we call atmospheric escape, when the gas particles are not gravitationally bound to the planet anymore. And uh, I guess a quick uh, nutshell explanation of, uh, of this process is warranted. So when you have your planet right here and it receives a lot of uh, high energy radiation, usually in, usually in the form of X-rays and extreme ultraviolet. This will cause heating and, uh, ex and atmospheric expansion. And when the collisional layers, which here are in orange and yellow, when they overflow the Roche radius, which is in white, the circle, the white circle, when they overflow that limit, we, ha we have uh, hydrodynamic escape. Now this process is very vigorous and it can potentially erode a significant part of, of the atmosphere of small planets. And this is especially important for young planets because when the system is young, the star emits a lot more high energy radiation. So that's when we think that, the, that planets or at least short period planets lose the, the bulk of their atmosphere. Sometimes the, the primordial atmosphere can be completely eroded especially for rocky planets. Um, we think hydrodynamic escape is so pervasive in short period planets, uh, or exoplanets, because uh, it imprints features in the population of exoplanets. So here on the left, you have the fam now famous radius gap uh, in which uh, planets with radii around 1.8, 
Earth radii are rare, or we have this gap in their population right here. Uh, another interesting feature is called the hot Neptune desert, which, which is here on the right. So we see a lack of Neptune-sized planets that are very irradiated in this uh, triangle right here. We think that these two features, the, they are mo mainly carved, carved by atmospheric escape. Um, having that in mind, uh, one of the ways that you can infer or study atmospheric escape in, in exoplanets is by observing it directly or semi-directly. And uh, you can, uh, what one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Vincent Bourrier, what he does is to make simulations, based on observations, he makes simulations of the escape, uh, dynamical uh, simulations of the escape in exospheres of exoplanets. So here on the left, we have an example of GG436b, which I'll briefly explain soon. And the right, we have another simulation, this time for the helium-rich thermosphere and also a little bit of exospheric helium here in blue for the warm Neptune happy 11 b which was recently discovered to have this helium-rich um, atmosphere very recently. Um, and by the way, these two simulations, they were based with, uh, with transmission spectroscopy, both in Lyman alpha, which is in ultraviolet, and uh, helium in, the, in infrared. But let's quickly do a, a little bit of history lesson, because uh, back in 2003, the first detection of an exosphere around an exoplanet was published. And it's, it was around the well, now well-known hot Jupiter HD 209458b using Lyman alpha transmission spectroscopy. So here on the left, you have the Lyman alpha emission of the whole star, and you observe it before and during the transit. Usually, nowadays, we also observe after the transit as well, but uh, for this particular case, they had only before and during, and we look for changes in the stellar spectrum, the Lyman alpha spectrum, uh, when the plant then passed in front of the whole star. Now, this technique, varies a, is different, is a little bit different from transmission spectroscopy at longer wavelengths because usually we don't have a lot of continuum flux in ultraviolet, particularly for small stars. So we usually work with the Lyman up with the emission lines. Anyway, here on the right, we have the light curve of the Lyman alpha band pass. And we see that, and by the way, the transit is delimited by the vertical lines. And we see that during the transit, the flux, the stellar flux decreases by 15%. Now we know from uh, other measurements that the opaque disk of this hot Jupiter blocks approximately, I think 1% of the stellar light. So this additional 15% here is caused by a hydrogen cloud that surrounds this hot Jupiter. Um, but I would say that the most spectacular case detected uh, to, to this day is of uh, the warm Neptune gg 46 b which was published back in 2015. And we, if you look at the stellar Lyman alpha emission during the transit, you see that it decreases by 50%, which is to this date, I think is the strongest atmospheric signal ever detected for an exoplanet. And here on the right, we have a simulation of the exosphere gg 46 um, we think that this large, very large, by the way, this cloud is larger than the whole star. And uh, we think that one of the ways that you can feed this, uh, this large cloud is by hydrodynamic escape. Um, so in one of my, in one of the projects of my PhD, uh, we were trying to find metals in the exosphere g 46 b which would be a smoking gun evidence for hydrodynamic escape. So we were looking for things like silicon, carbon, and oxygen. And this time, instead of the still spectrograph on Hubble, we use the cost spectrograph, and now you see why that was important uh, in a few minutes. We did not find evidence for metals. We found a lot of stellar activity, which uh, is kind of a trend in exoplanets. You think you found something, but it was probably stellar activity. So here you have light curves of gg 46 phase folded to the rotational period of the star. And we see a very uh, clear sinusoidal modulation, which we attribute to a long-lived active region in the surface of gg 46 
even having in mind that GG426 is considered a quiet M dwarf, but when you go to ultraviolet wavelength, things get uh, more active it's, as it seems. Um, and this activity region was stable for a few years, which is kind of impressive. If you think about solar type stars, they are, their active regions usually last a few days, but for M dwarfs, it can last a few years, up to 60 rotations. Now, this is not unheard of. We know that Proxima Centauri, for instance, has an active, had an active region that was stable for nine years or, or approximately nine years. Um, okay, but we didn't detect metals in gg 6 b but we did manage to reproduce the Lyman Alpha transit of the planet. And this is significant because we usually don't use COS for Lyman Alpha spectroscopy because COS is a circular aperture spectrograph, so there's a lot of geochronal contamination in it. But we came up with this technique to get rid or to remove, efficiently remove the, the contamination from cost spectrum, even for stars or targets that are as faint as GG436. And we managed to reproduce the, um, the signal. Another interesting conclusion from this result here is that the atmospheric escape in GG436 is stable. GG436b, the planet, is stable because these observations were done many years after this, this detection. So a hot tip from me, if you wanna do Lyman Alpha transit spectroscopy for, for, for instance, a, a bright test target, just go for a cost because uh, it has better sensitivity, it has better wavelength coverage, better resolution in nominal mode, and little to no systematics at all when compared to this. Now, you only have to deal with the geochronal contamination, but there are public resources to deal with that. There are public geochronal uh, templates that you can use, and the code that I use to make this remove is also publicly available. All right, so these results, they not only yield uh, atmospheric information, they also yield information about the high energy environment around the planet. So for instance, there's this very recent study, and I, I found it really cool, uh, uh, published by Kevin France and collaborators in which they observed Barnard star, which was recently discovered to have a rocky planet orbiting it. And during the Hubble observation, it was five orbits. They uh, measured two flares. So they are able to infer about the UV spectrum of the star, both at quiescent state and flare state. And even cooler, I think, is uh, they simulated atmospheric escape in the rocky planet at both a quiet state and flare state. And one of the conclusions that they arrived to is that even at the activity level that we observe today at Barnard and Star, this is a 10 billion year old star, uh, the planet would still be able to retain a secondary atmosphere, which is a, a very cool result. Okay, just switching gears a little bit from ultraviolet and space-based spectroscopy, let's move on to infrared because very recently people have been using the helium triplet in one micron to also infer about atmospheric escape in, in, in exoplanets. There is this paper here published in 2018 for the detection of helium in WAS-107b and the helium channel is this blue point right here. By the way, this is a low resolution transit spectroscopy. And there are other features here, like water, for instance. But one of the main features in this paper was the helium detection. But because it's infrared, you can also do this from the ground in high resolution this time. For instance, you can use Carmenes. And this is what one of my colleagues, Homan Alar, did. And they detected a helium rich thermosphere and a little bit of exospheric helium on happy 11b, which is another warm Neptune. Somewhat similar to 0436, not very similar, but somewhat similar. And when you have high resolution, the advantage is you can start doing um, some simulations, some dynamical simulations for the atmospheric escape like my other colleague does. Anyway, there are many instruments from the ground that you can use to do helium triplet transmission spectroscopy, but as far as I know, there's only one in the Southern Hemisphere. If somebody knows another one, please tell me. But as far as I know, there's only Phoenix, the Phoenix spectrograph in Gemini South, and uh, which is a visiting instrument on, uh, on Gemini. And last year, we obtained a DDT program to do transmission spectroscopy for WAS-127B, not to be confused with 107B, this one. 
I wanted to do WAS 107 B, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be available in the time frame that we had. So we went for WAS 127 B instead. And uh, the result, these are the results. Here on the left, you have the time series of the transit spectra. And uh, unfortunately, it's a non-detection. If, uh, if we had a signal, we would be some, something like a yellow blob following these red lines, but unfortunately, we don't see it. And uh, here on the right, you have the combined transmission spectrum. <clears throat> And uh, we think that the reason this plant doesn't exhibit a helium feature is because it's a very old system. Uh, there's an emerging trend among uh, uh, gas giants that were observed for helium transit spectroscopy. It seems that those that, are, that receive a lot of high energy radiation, which here in this plot are on the right, so these ones, they exhibit a strong helium feature while those that are not uh, as much radiated in high energy, like WAS-127B, CAL-9B, and G-426B, they don't exhibit that feature. Things start to get a little bit more complicated for sub-Neptunes and super-Earths, which are here in red, because we have not obtained any or any detection so far. So we cannot say the same. We cannot say that they also have the same trend. Uh, we need to increase the sample for sub-Neptunes. Um, there are two, um, so just coming back to those features that I mentioned, the desert and the valley, there are two, not competing, but there are two hypotheses to explain it. One of them is photo evaporation, which is when you have the external irradiation from the whole star that sweeps away the planet's atmosphere. There's another, another hypothesis called core power mass loss, which is uh, based on the internal energy of the planet that causes the, the atmospheric escape. But we don't know, it, we don't understand uh, that well what's the respective role of each of these processes in shaping these features. So one way to test this hypothesis is to observe young planets and escape young planets. Having that in mind, I led a Hubble ob observing program last year to try to detect the hydrogen rich exosphere of the s 2 ab uh, young transiting planet recently discovered by TESS. And I will show you a sneak peek preview of one of the results that we got, but keep in mind that these are preliminary results. And uh, I will show you the light curve, one of the light curves of the s 2 ab And we see a decreasing flux of approximately 40%, a little bit before the transit and during the transit as well. And we think that this uh, suggests the presence of an exosphere in this planet too. The data analysis is currently underway and we plan on publishing it very soon, hopefully still this year. So keep an eye out for that. Also keep an eye out for more young planets because I know that our, I know at least a few groups out there, um, not only uh, my collaborations, but, but also there are many other groups out there that are also doing helium or Lyman alpha transit spectroscopy for young planets and everyone wants to detects those exospheres. Also, I've, I've been collaborating with a team at CFA composed by Munaza Alam and James Kirk and Mercedes Lopez Morales. And we have a program with CAC near SPAC to detect helium in young planets, in three young planets. The observations will be carried out by the end of the year and hopefully we'll have results by next year. And uh, okay, um, I'm almost finished with my talk and I, and I wanna leave you with, uh, with something that I think we'll have reserved for us when it comes to ultraviolet transit spectroscopy. So you remember this, uh, the Earth's exosphere that I showed in the beginning. Actually, one of my first projects during my, my PhD was to take this observation and uh, the model uh, that one of my collaborators created based on this observation. And we wanted to simulate how this would look like if we had a, an Earth-like exosphere transiting a nearby M dwarf. And um, so we made those simulations. And, uh, unfortunately, the signal would be too shallow for Hubble, so it would not be detectable right now. But it, is, it would be detectable with LUVOIR in the LUMOS spectrograph in 10 transits if, uh, if, if we're using the largest design for LUVOIR. 
Beauvoir, Beauvoir currently has two designs, one for 12 meters, one for nine meters, as far as I remember. In the case for the smaller design, it would take something like 15 to 20 transits to detect a earth like exosphere around a rocky planet orbiting an M dwarf. And this is cool because it provides another pathway to detect Earth-like conditions in rocky planets. Um, okay, so I uh, will finish my talk. Normally I leave a few take home messages, but th since this is a short format, uh, I guess uh, I will leave you with one hot tip. If you wanna, you, if you wanna do helium transmission spectroscopy for Southern hemisphere targets, definitely apply for time on Gemini South and the Phoenix spectrograph. It's currently the only one available uh, to do that as far as I know. And uh, there are some caveats in that. And uh, if you have any questions of that, I can, I can answer. So, all right, uh, thank you for, for your attention. And uh, I'm open to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Leonardo. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. <clears throat> well, this is really wonderful. And, and also, I mean, I should say that we're delighted that you're taking all these beautiful spectra and, and analyzing <laughs> this work. Um, and, and like that, ex that, that sort of personal gratitude extends to the fact that I don't have to. Um, but I wanted <laughs> to come back to um, uh, DS Tuck um, uh -huh. and your observations there. And I wondered if we could look at that um, light curve together. Yeah. So um, this is Lyman Alpha, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And something I was wondering if I'm correct in seeing is that the deepest parts of the transit are at times of minus three or minus two, something like that, hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you talk about the geometry relative to the orbit and what that might mean for the shape of this exosphere and yeah, its yeah. sort of size relative to the orbit what are yeah. how can we sort of reconstruct that yeah we think it's similar to gj, to GJ for two six if i go back a few slides we think it's something similar like this except that i th um so the transit happens a few hours before so we're actually doing like some kind of like back of, back of the envelope calculation this morning. And we think that the exosphere would extend to something like two planet radii beyond the planet itself. But that's only considering if it was a, an opaque disk kind of thing. Sure. But because it's diffuse, it probably extends to a lot more than that. So we think it probably has a similar shape, like a cometary shape, like gg 436 b as well. Interesting, interesting. And but in order to have any constraints on the geometry, we need to run simulations. And we, we plan on doing the simulations as soon, as soon as we finish doing the data analysis itself. Awesome. And if we keep thinking about this exosphere or, or, or similar ones, um, Avi Loeb is asking uh, if, we, if we like dig to the earth centered observations, like looking uh -huh. back at Earth, that beautiful image that you started with. And um, you're thinking about Louvoir and, and sort mm -hmm. of the future detection of this sort of thing. Um, can we talk about, uh, you know, this week's observations of Venus and what would it take to detect biosignatures in those sorts of spectra? Mm. Um, so like would your earth observation, what would it take to show biosignatures in that, in your observations of earth? Oh, this, uh, the, the hydrogen observation. So basically if we observe these, this thing is hydrogen. So if we observe something like this, we could only infer, we could only say, oh, this planet has a, an exosphere similar to the earth. Now yes. in the case of the earth, uh, we think that the Earth's exosphere is mostly fed by photodissociation dissociation of water. So you have water molecules that go to the upper atmosphere of the Earth, and they photodissociate because of the uh, irradiation from the whole star. So hydrogen is very light. It will escape the, our atmosphere and will populate our exosphere. Uh, we think that we could say, if we detect something like this around a rocky planet, uh, we could say, oh, this planet has water in the lower parts of the atmosphere. 
It could also have methane. I think methane also produces a hydrogen rich exosphere as well, but it's probably not um, as rich in hydrogen as if it were uh, water. But anyway, I, I'm not the one that ran simulations for this, but uh, you, if you found something like this around an exoplanet, you can infer a little bit about the composition in the lower atmosphere. Avi, would you like to follow up on that at all? You can just unmute yourself if you would. Oh, so the question is whether the, there could be anything other than hydrogen detectable. Um, in ultraviolet, you can also look for oxygen. Um, the problem with oxygen is that the signal will be uh, even more attenuated. The signal will be smaller. The Earth's exosphere is also rich in, in oxygen. And we see that when we take Hubble observations. Because, uh, for instance, we cost the, what, what I mentioned before, the geochronal emission, that's basically the Earth's exosphere shining on our instrument. There's also a lot of contamination from oxygen. So the Earth's exosphere is also rich in, in oxygen. And there's a tiny little bit of nitrogen, but I think nitrogen would not be detectable for uh, an exospheric Earth-like nitrogen would not be detectable for an exoplanet. But oxygen is possible. I think we would need uh, more transits to than 10 to detect something like this. But it also depends on the distance of the system. It depends on the, uh, there's actually a surprising dependence on the radio velocity of the star. So the star is, um, has a high uh, radio velocity. It's actually easier to detect these features because uh, you have the, the ISM absorption is gonna happen away, far away from the, on the stellar emission lines. So it really depends on the, on the whole star mm -hmm. on, as well. And when, by the way, we're not even talking about stellar activity in these observations, which would probably be present in there. So that's also something that we have to think about when planning these observations. Interesting. Leonardo, thank you so much. There are um, more questions on the Slack than we have time to ask right now, but uh, mm -hmm. we're hoping you can chime in there as well. And we're really yeah, grateful yeah. for thank all your you. insights on this fascinating topic. Thank you very um, much. Thanks, Leonardo. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, our next speaker today is Gila Glant who is um, a junior graduate student at Technion in Israel. Um, and Hila works on a topic that is near and dear uh, to many of people in the IPC. So she's studying uh, common envelope binaries and uh, of course those are now very exciting as in the context of uh, gravitational wave detection, but also like she makes a connection to uh, um, a really important phase of stellar evolution, like the um, like the AGB stars that they are really important as uh, uh, luminous stars that dominate extragalactic uh, sources as well. So it's uh, really important to understand uh, this phase of stellar evolution in more detail. And so today we are very fortunate to hear from this uh, uh, very uh, new work uh, from Hila. Uh, so Hila, I think you can. Uh, share the screen and take it away. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Can you see my screen and the mouse? Yes. Yeah, oh, great. Thanks. So hi everyone and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to share my work with you. So I'm Mila Glanz, a PhD student at the Technion in Israel, currently on my first year. And today I'll talk about some new perspective uh, on the common envelope evolution. And in particular, I'll focus on our research about the ejection of the common envelope by dust driven winds. Uh, all of this was done together with my uh, master's and PhD advisor, Hagai Peretz, which I think is also here. Uh, and he is also from the Technion. Okay. So before we go directly to the problem of the common envelope, let's look at the evolution of a single star, which is much better understood. So if we take, for instance, a sun-like star, after finishing its hydrog hydrogen burning at its core, the core shrinks and the envelope expands and cool down. So it moves to the uh, radiant red branch. Then after the core is dense and warm enough to ignite the helium burning, 
it moves to the horizontal branch, and then after some, uh, some time, it starts to uh, uh, burn helium at its outer shells and move to the asymptotic giant branch, or AGB. There, uh, it experiences thermal pulsation that causes the loss of most of its envelope by slow stellar winds until finally its outer envelope is ejected and becomes a planetary nebula and its remnant core becomes a white dwarf. So now we know that if the star has a close companion, its evolution probably be different because if the two objects are close enough, they transfer mass from one to the other by Rothschild overflow. And if this process is not stable, then a shared envelope is formed and this is our common envelope. So we believe the common envelope phase has an important role in the evolution of many binaries and multiple system. Uh, this includes uh, progenitors of explosive, explosive events such as type 1a supernovae, um, gamma ray bursts, X-ray binaries, double uh, white warp neutron stars that can produce gravitational waves and many more. And the reason that we think that those systems have experienced the common envelope phase is that if we follow the single stellar evolution theory, which I just briefly presented, at least one of the components uh, should have once been much larger than their uh, current detective um, separation. So this implies that there should have been some migration process and the, envelope, the evolved envelope should somehow have been evaporated. So let's go briefly through the main stage of the common envelope, uh, which will also be indicated here as CE. So first of all, it's formation, then the fast in spiral motion of the uh, two components inside the envelope, and then a final and longer stage, which might happen in which the shared envelope is eventually ejected. So the first one, the formation, is most likely derived by the evolutionary growth of one of the components. So the star, which is also called, uh, called the primary donor uh, star, grows to a radius which is large enough to fill its Rochelob and then transfer mass to its companion. And then if this process uh, is not stable, so the uh, mass transfer is too high or the orbital angular momentum is too high, uh, the system is unable to synchronize the motion of the envelope and the two cores. And this leads us for, uh, to the next stage, which is the fast spiral in. It's also happened in a dynamical time scale. And uh, what happens is the companion spiral deeper and deeper inside the envelope. And in order to conserve the angular momentum, the envelope expands. And at the end of this stage, uh, the envelope might be ejected away and the two, uh, maybe remnants uh, may merge or remain in a short stable orbit. Afterwards, if the envelope has not yet been uh, ejected or unbounded, uh, there will maybe another longer phase, which we call the self-regulating uh, phase, and uh, in which due to dissipation and dynamical friction, uh, the spiral in motion may slow down enough to synchronize. Then after a few dynamical stay, uh, time scales, uh, the common envelope process may happen all over again, or there will be some other important processes during this stage that uh, can derive the envelope outwards. Until finally, the whole envelope is being ejected from the system. And the reason that we believe that the envelope must be ejected at the end is that its remaining recalls, uh, recalls the mutual measure of any post-common envelope binary. Uh, but we do observe such survivors. Um, so at the end, we will be left uh, with a binary system consisted of the remnant core and the companion, probably in a short period orbit, or with one star which, is, uh, which has been formed from the merger of the donor's core and the companion. And uh, the ejected gas will be as a type of a, a planetary nebula somewhere around the system. And now after we went through all those stages, let's see an example. So here is one of the hydrodynamical simulation, uh, which, which is actually a part of our uh, recent work about a triple common envelope. And what we see here is the common envelope evolution of eight uh, solar masses red giant with two solar mass companion at a distance which is twice the size of, of the giant's radius. So we can see the formation of, of the common envelope and the very rapid spiral in of the companion and then the expansion of the envelope as a consequence. I hope the resolution is good enough via Zoom. So you can see that uh, now the companion moves 
more rapidly and deeper in the envelope until in this case, they finally merge. Uh, so we can divide the main open questions or goals of the common envelope evolution into two groups. The first one is about the migration process and in particular, what are the connections between the initial condition of the interacting system and the final outcomes, the final observation, uh, observable system, the orbital parameters, uh, stereotypes, and what happens if this system is more complex as it should be for a triple system. And the second question is about the ejection of the envelope. What causes complete unbinding and how much time does it take? Does it happen during the uh, spiral in or in a long and tight cell, like in the self-regulating phase? So today I'll start by presenting the scenario that can help us solve the question of the envelope ejection. And if we'll have time, we'll maybe talk about, shortly about some other works we're currently working on that uh, relate to the first question and are indicated here on purpose. Uh, and in any case, we will be very happy to discuss them later on, later on here via sl uh, Slack or uh, wherever you want. So the problem is that even though this process was simulated many times also by us, no one could actually eject the entire envelope, but only a few percent. And it's mostly been, been bounded at the end. So which means that there should be uh, probably another physical process involved, which was not considered previously. So now if you remember the first slide, you probably understand why we talked about the evolution of a single star and in particular, we mentioned the ejection of the envelope at the end of its AGB phase, which we mostly know how to explain. So let's see if it's possible to use the same mechanism also for a ray giant that goes through a common envelope phase. And this is exactly what we investigated in this research about efficient common envelope ejection through dust driven winds. So first let's understand better the ejection of the single AGB star. So the AGB star experienced thermal pulsation that pushed material from the inner layer outwards to a distance where the temperature is low enough to allow dust formation. So some of the material is condensed to dust and some collide with it. Now the dust is higher opacity than its surrounding. So it's being pushed away by the radiation pr uh, pressure from the stellar core and by collision and coupling with the gas, it accelerates the gas away from the star. So without the dust, the gas which is pushed away will just go down and lose all of this kin uh, kinetic energy and then fall back to the star. But now as the dust gains momentum from uh, the absorption and scattering of photon from the star, and is pushed outwards, it will produce drag force on the colliding gas molecule and now the gas can pass its escape velocity and be ejected. So the first condition to allow dust driven wind is that the luminosity of the star can overcome its gravitational forces. So we can define this gamma to be the ratio between relative acceleration to gravity and it will take values greater than unity uh, where winds can occur. And we can see that this ratio is larger for larger luminosities and larger opacities. And it's actually that determines whether the motion is dominated by radiation pressure or by gravity. And uh, the condensation temperature depends on the type of grains, uh, which is affected by the chemical composition of the star and the ratio between carbon and oxygen, but it's mostly around 1500 Kelvin. And in order to have an efficient process, there should be a region where uh, there will be enough material that can condense into dust. The temperature should be low enough so this dust won't sublimate. And the dust should be in relative equilibrium in order to form and grow. And we can find this minimal condensation radius of the star uh, from its relative equilibrium between the heating from the stellar uh, light and the thermal cooling of the dust grain. The heating mostly depends on uh, the optical depth of this region, uh, which is mostly uh, in uh, a optically thin shell for AGB star because it's much above its surface. And then we can uh, make some approximation. We take P to be uh, the power law dependence of the opacity on the wavelength to be one, which is 
the average for type of grains uh, which are most likely to form in sun like evolved star. And then we construct this relation between the minimal condensation radius and the uh, parameters of our evolved star. And if we uh, substitute value for an evolved sun like star, we get that it's somewhere around 700 solar radii, much above uh, the radius of the star, which is around 200. So overall, what happens in this process is that material from the star should uh, reach a region where it is cool enough to allow dust condensation. Then uh, the radiation pressure on the dust should be high enough so the gas can overtake its escape velocity. And there should be enough material that can interact with this dust and be ejected as a consequence. So now let's show that this condition also ho holds for post-common envelope giant. So for AGB star, it's quite trivial, but what about red giants? So during the common envelope phase, the envelope expands extensively, even beyond the region where the temperature is low enough to allow dust formation. Then at this radius, the density is of the same order of magnitude as the density of the pulsating gas of the single AGB star. And the red giant core also radiates on this dust with a comparable luminosity. So now the difference is that this region is inside the solar envelope and not outside as a, in a, a single AGB. So we don't need those pulsations to bring the material to condense it to dust and to interact with, uh, with this. But on the other hand, we should take into account that it's now located inside an optically thick shell and not thin as it was in the outer region. So we can neglect, neglect the luminosity of the companion. And since the common envelope happens in a dynamical time scale, uh, the total luminosity which originates in the nuclear reactions in the core do not change. So we can construct this relation between the effective temperature at a radius after the common envelope and the initial uh, parameters of the star prior to the common envelope phase. And now if we want to draw the new condition of the star, so we have the stellar core which radiates on the outer shells then at some point the uh, effective temperature becomes the condensation temperature, so dust can form. And uh, gamma, which is the ratio between the radi uh, radiation acceleration to gravity, uh, goes very fast and becomes greater than unity, which implies that uh, winds can occur. And this dust-driven re uh, region continues until gamma drops to unity back and the winds can low, uh, are no longer possible. But we expect that uh, the region above, if exists, will also be pushed away by collision with the material that is driven from uh, the dust-driven winds. And now we can follow the same calculation to find the condensation radius, but inside an optical thick shell. And with uh, using the temperature relation that we just derived. And um, we get this dependence between the, con the minimal condensation radius and the uh, initial parameters of the star before the common envelope begin. And if we uh, plug in the, um, the values for an evolved sun-like into a red giant, after the common envelope, we get about 350 solar radii. So it's really uh, deeply inside the extended envelope. So there is an, a, there is indeed no need for uh, a depulsation because the material is already there. And if we want to talk about the time of evaporation, so it's mainly derived from the amount of material which can condense into dust, the amount of energy that radiates on the dust, and the amount of material that the dust can push outwards. And we can make some order of magnitude calculation to find this uh, ejection time. And uh, if we want to do a simple momentum consideration uh, of the envelope above this uh, condensation radius and the energy from the accelerated dust, uh, then we get to the time scale of the evaporation should be quite similar uh, to the one of a, an a single AGB star, uh, which is in a good correlation with work done by Michele and Peretz and Yugo Shevetal. Uh, it also suggested long time scale for the common envelope ejection. And now let me show you an example we did to examine the dem and demonstrate our calculations. So we simulated a sun-like star, which was evolved into a ray giant with 83 solar radii and luminosity of about 1000 solar luminosities. Um, we took a main sequence companion with almost identical mass and 
put it just on the edge of the envelope, so we force the common envelope process to begin. Uh, we ran everything via the MUSE framework. We created our uh, red giant model using MESA. And then we mapped this model into 3D SPH model with the core and companion as point masses. And we used Gadget 2 to simulate the common envelope evolution. We first ran some uh, relaxation stage uh, to, avoid, um, sudden, uh, to avoid some potential forces that uh, was co were caused by the sudden change in resolution and in the equation of state between the different codes. And then we ran the common envelope evolution itself for 1400 days. Until at the end, the system has been stabilized in a short period orbit with a steel bonded gigantic envelope around it. Then we calculated where the condensation radius should be and checked the other conditions. So we've not yet actually simulated the dust, but only calculated its approximate affection. And this is the cumulative uh, mass distribution after the common envelope process. And it shows here the condensation radius in a dashed line. And we see that uh, uh, indeed most of the steel bounded envelope is above this uh, uh, radius, which means that if this process can successfully eject all of the material above this uh, dust formation region, it should ve be very efficient. And here is another comparison between a sun-like star, which was evolved into an AGB on the left and our post-common envelope red giant. On the right, the dashed line is, the, is where the dust should form. And here on the left, we see that uh, the AGB star must have the pulsation to bring material to this dust formation uh, radius uh, to form it and uh, to interact with it. And on the right, in our post-common envelope red giant, it's deeper in, deeply inside the extended envelope. So there is no need for those pulsation because the material is already there, although those might happen and, even, and make this uh, process even more efficient. This is another comparison between the average AGP star and our post-common envelope red giant. And we see that its density uh, profile continues way beyond uh, the size of the single AGP star and its uh, density around the uh, dust formation region are indeed comparable. And if we want to summarize this process, so we found a potential new efficient channel to eject the common envelope by the same model that was suggested for the ejection of the AGP still envelope. And uh, since most of the common envelope extend beyond the dust formation radius, uh, the mass flow through dust driven wind should be very effective. And in principle, the common envelope can look very similar to the AGB stage and the ejection time will probably also be comparable. And uh, in order to improve our work, we still need to account for the different type of brains. They can differ in their uh, condensation temperature, their absorption efficiencies and sizes. And the dust can also form in the spiral phase. So we should take this into account also uh, in the calculation of the ejection time and also in the affection of the combo envelope evolution itself. And we still need to make a complete simulation, which includes the common envelope evolution, together with the dust formation, radiation pressure, and some other important processes like heating and cooling via convection, erosion, and many more. Um, so I think that now my time uh, has end, ended. So uh, thank you very much for uh, listening and feel free to ask me any question. Thank you. Thank you, Hila. <clears throat> so um, I, I have a question and I think it relates really um, closely to um, one that Yvette Sindes is up, uh, asking. And that has to do with the observational appearance of these sources during the uh, tens of thousands potentially of years that it takes for this envelope to eventually be evaporated. So first of all, are, are we correct in understanding that the, the current thinking is that the power of the star takes, takes 10 to the four or 10 to the five years to drive off the envelope? So uh, if there's no more help like uh, from other processes, yes, 
all, only by dust driven wind probably yes yeah i mean we we didn't do the uh, ac the more accurate calculation by including all of the uh the other processes and heating and cooling but uh yes right 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 so potentially they could uh play off each other in sort of an interesting nonlinear way yes. that would change the answer yep yep yes. that's a really good point um and Okay, so then the question I think that I've wondered for a long time and, and we're also hearing from the audience is um, we have really beautiful evidence for uh, objects that we think are either mergers or common envelope transients. Um, first, sh exhibiting sort of optical transient uh, like signatures. So I'm thinking about an object like uh, V838 mon that you had the beautiful light echo from um, and uh, then uh, for having these really incredibly sort of dust rich um, remnants and so I think that's clear evidence that the sorts of processes that you're alluding to are happening um, but then the question is how I, I or I guess I'd I want to break it up into two parts. So how do we observe this in action? And if we see, you know, a dust rich source, what can we do to identify it with this process as opposed to say a single star AGB ejection? Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure I can completely answer this, but that's totally fair. <laughs> yeah, but unfortunately, I think then since uh, the companion uh, is probably less evolved, and probably its luminosity will be uh, yeah, ignorable. Yeah. So I'm not sure it's really easy to to uh, yeah to make this uh, separation between. Uh, the single AGB star and, and the common envelope, yeah. Yeah, it's a really because tough question. Because the dust blocks all of the opacity and then- That's right. Of, so, yeah. so you see some dust and shrouded luminous source. And then my other question is, I think it would be absolutely amazing if we could um, see some post um, interaction remnant like this, some dust rich remnant and ask whether there was a merged binary at the core or a sort of surviving separated binary at the core. So you're talking about two scenarios where essentially the same process happens up until there's one outcome or another. And uh, I was curious whether you had any insight from your work on whether on ways we might distinguish the outcome when we're when we're sort of observationally looking at these sources. So I'm not sure the dust has any connection with it, but understanding better the common envelope evolution itself. So how much does the envelope expands in a, in a case that they finally merge uh, in comparison to, to where uh, you have a short period orbit in the end? Interesting. And maybe the shape of this uh, planetary nebulae? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah. Yeah, so maybe they'd be in like sort of secondary features like that. That's uh -huh. really interesting. And then Anna Bonazza is asking um, if sort of following up on, on the appearance of these envelopes over time, um, would something like kinematic data from Gaia help in identifying those um, sorts of sources from sort of an, a, a, a separate population of AGB stars? Or post AGB. So, I'm not sure that Haggai is here, but they have a paper that they use. Uh, it's Yegoshev et al. and they used Gaia to uh, to say some some uh, predictions about the uh, time scales of the common envelope. And uh, so perhaps he can say some more about this. I'm not sure that it depends uh, uh, on the dust formation, but they do use Gaia to to. Uh, enrich this uh, discussion yeah and then um i think we have time for about one last question and, and that's from paul green and uh who's asking uh do we know how much mass the um, main sequence companion um, might accrete in that process and is that tracked in your simulations 
Uh, well, no, in this simulation, we didn't account the uh, accretion because uh, we tried this and it was very low uh, ratio uh, in compared to its mass. So we canceled it to, to have a better resolution. Um, so I'm not sure I can answer you this now, but I do have like past results. So I can maybe, I can maybe find them if you, if you want and we can discuss this later on. Yeah. Nice. Well, that might be a nice avenue for further discussion on the Slack and also the link you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I, I, I'm really sort of personally optimistic that, that this sort of insight that you're bringing to this problem, I think will be really fruitful in, in understanding it and also in combination with, with all of the different data sources that you've been mentioning. If we pull all that information together with the sort of modeling you're doing, I'm hopeful we can make we can make progress. So I was really delighted to hear your ideas. Thank you. So with that, we, uh, we bring this week's scientific look into a close. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thanks uh, Leonardo and Pila for wonderful talks. Uh, please stick around on Slack. As, um, yeah, there, there have been some more questions. Uh, and yeah, keep in mind that like we, we are meeting again next week. So for uh, pe uh, local pe people in the audience, if you have something cool to uh, tell us about in, in five minutes uh, or less, please sign up for a CFA Byte and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.